Morning, everyone. Um, it's January the 2nd. Uh, I had a nice, relaxing day yesterday. Um, and after my live session yesterday, um, I, I know that was a very quick, rushed session. Um, I'm used to spending a bit more time on some of those uh, topics. Um, but it seems that the quick format actually helped people sort of get some information and the data we're getting from um, from Zarthisius and Frank and Safe Diversity Visa is uh, is understandable um, and well presented and and generally speaking, it seems like people are actually uh, understanding it, which is awesome. I'm I'm thrilled about that. Um, and um, so you know, so there is data there. We've got a lot of good good answers. Uh, it's important to understand though that there are many answers we still can't give just because we've got the SEAC data um, and just because you know I've got eight nine years of experience with this it, it my experience tells me that there are some things we shouldn't answer right there are some questions that uh, we shouldn't be uh, sure about we're actually better to sort of wait and see um, we know a bit more today than we knew a few days ago um, and we've got, you know, important evidence to sort of uh, assess whether we need lawsuits and that sort of thing. But we can't predict the future. We don't know what's going to happen with the, you know, with the COVID virus. We don't know what's going to happen with political situations in some countries. Um, we don't know. There, there may be some countries with embassies open today, working perfectly normally. Uh, and, you know, all of a sudden those embassies might have to close for whatever reason. Right, there might be embassies that are closed today that frankly I don't expect to open quickly. Um, but you know, those embassies might get reopened and they might actually start processing. That's less likely, frankly, but it's possible, right? So, we don't really know um, some of those things. So, let's not try and guess the unguessable, uh, the unknowable things. Let's just focus on, we, on what we do know and then let's say, okay, we'll have to wait and see what happens uh, with the rest of it. Okay, so I hope you'll continue with that vein with me. Um, let me just say at the beginning, if you ask me, here's my case number, when do you predict my interview will be? When will I get my uh, DS-260 process? When will, you know, on my case, I'm not going to answer those questions. Um, I'm not going to make predictions. I'm not going to answer those questions. Those questions, frankly, are a waste of my time. They're a waste of your time ask asking what you need to listen to is what I'm saying about all the other factors that we can't anticipate. And for those reasons, I'm not going to try and predict anything. So if you just ask me, you know, time and time again, you're literally just wasting my time. And uh, honestly, I don't have time to waste in life. So, uh, Bundix, nice to see you. Happy New Year to you. Um, Bundix has been coming around on these uh, live sessions for a long time. So, uh, you know, very nice. Malia, good morning to you. Um, I had a great New Year's, Christmas and New Year's was very nice, um, very relaxing. And yesterday we took uh, a long, long walk through Carmel. We did some great stuff, had a lovely family day. It was really nice. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, up until now, my, the embassy has not called me yet. What's your advice? AP. AP, the process goes for 90 days, but within that 90 days, COVID hates the world. Okay. When you say up until now you're in you, you're on AP, you're on AP since when? Jamal, you're going to have to be a bit more clear. Tell me, uh, are you a 2021 case that was on AP? If you were, then your time ended. And unless you're on the lawsuit or unless we get the um, the legislation changes, then there is no more hope for your case. AP uh, cases that are still on AP on September 30th each year, they end. The, they never get fixed, right? That's the normal thing. Um, if, on the other hand, you're saying this 90 days was because you had an October or a November interview, which seems weird because there were very few of those, um, then, yeah, you know, the 90 days, like, there are various bullshit things the government says. They send documents, uh, they send emails saying it will take six weeks to process your documents. That was bullshit. Some of you actually believe that. <laughs> um, it's nuts. It never made sense. It would be two weeks for this case, and it would be four months for the next case. It, you know, it, 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 there was nothing specific about six weeks. They say things sometimes 
And you need to learn to take that with a pinch of salt. You need to know to ignore that. And in the same way, there is nothing that says AP has to last 90 days. It, it could be five days. It could be, you know, 300 days. I've seen AP last a full 12 months, right? There's nothing to do with 90 days. But what I don't understand in your particular question, Jamel, is when you're waiting from, are you a 2021 or are you a 2022 case? When was your interview? Make that clear. Okay, uh, why is KDU not starting an interview? This is, uh, firstly, I don't know. I have no idea what they're not, why they're not interviewing. But it is an interesting question to me because the fate of the Asia region rests firmly on what happens in Nepal and to some extent in Iran. When I think about, um, when I think about trying to predict, because in my own mind, yeah, I have predictions. I'll never tell you about it. But it, but if, if I if I think about how things should go mathematically, in Asia, for example, I start with the eighty five hundred visas, which are a quota. I take out immediately the number of visas which Nepal should get because they've got a very high uh, success rate, very high approval rate, very high response rate. If 38 people, if 3,800 people are selected in Nepal, you can be pretty sure that in a normal year, 37, 37, 50 people will get uh, visas, right, in Nepal. That's the, that's the, um, uh, that's the, the evidence of the success rate and the response rate, etc. in Nepal, right? So Nepal, if, if KDU Embassy, if Kathmandu Embassy is working, then you take the 8,500 quota for Asia and you take out 3,500 visas from that from that for Nepal straight away, just mentally. I'm, I'm not talking about that's how it happens by law or it's what happens in reality. I'm talking about that's what you do to sort of compute the rest of the cases. Then you say, okay, how many cases, how many visas are Iran going to get? And then you have to weigh that up. When the, when the Muslim ban was on, that number disappeared. Right when uh, the Muslim ban was revoked, those cases came back into possibility, and for and, and then in Iran you say, okay, there are three embassies that normally do interviews for Iranians. Can the can the selectees travel to those three embassies? Are those embassies working? Are they accepting those cases? And based on that, we would say, okay, out the roughly six thousand. Um, selectees that are, there are for Iran, how many of those visas are going to be um, issued? And you might say a thousand, you might say two thousand, you might dreaming, you might say three thousand. I don't think it's going to be three thousand, but uh, let's say it's two thousand, right? So you add the two thousand to the three and a half thousand, you got five and a half thousand visas out of eight and a half thousand visas gone. Then there's three thousand visas for the rest of Asia. Okay, and if you use that method, you can actually calculate how, I mean, to be honest, you can calculate mathematically where we should get to in terms of the, uh, the cutoff. It is possible to do that mathematically. But that mathematical calculation does not take into account, for example, the difficulties that other countries will have, like Yemen, like Afghanistan, um, and, you know, some of the challenges that there are in that region. And so... Um, uh, the reason I don't predict is because the politics, uh, political stuff like it's going on in, in uh, Afghanistan uh, or Yemen, um, the uh, difficulties with COVID, etc., not knowing what's going to happen in Kathmandu and, and so on, right? So, so yeah, long answer to say I have no idea what, what is going on with Kathmandu. They don't call me. I mean, even though I'm really important, right? <laughs> uh, I don't get phone calls from the embassy ever saying, what do you think, Simon? Do you think we should open this week? No embassy says that. They don't even let me know. I don't know why. It's just annoying. But they don't know. They don't let me know. So, so there you go. Uh, any news on DV 2021? No. The one thing I would say on DV 2020 and 2021 that you need to understand is that the Government have said it's going to take four months for them to fix their systems in order to issue visas. And that they predict, therefore, that until April, they're not going to start issuing visas for DV 2020 and 2021, right? That's just, just accept that. There's, there's nothing going to change that, right? Maybe it'll be March, maybe it'll be April, maybe it'll be May. But, you know, 
at the same time as that, that thing that we need to accept. So there's no point, frankly, in asking me until April, um, you know, what's happening with DB 2021. Just accept that. But the other thing is that there's an appeal process going through, and there's even a cross appeal on the go case and that sort of thing. So, um, so you know, we have to just wait and see also what happens on the appeals. I'm, I'm a little bit hopeful on the the appeals because uh, the government lawyers didn't get permission. It was widely assumed when they filed their um, uh, their appeals that they had permission to uh, to appeal. They didn't apparently. They didn't have that permission. Um, and so they were simply trying to preserve their opportunity to uh, to appeal. I had speculated about that um, earlier, but what does that mean? It means that if they now don't get the permission to appeal, because appeals cost money, they you know, and it's frankly a waste of time in this case, um, waste of time and money. Um, if they don't get permission to appeal, then they'll retract the appeals, right? They'll just withdraw. And, you know, but but even when they do that, we still have to wait till April for uh, the cases to be processed and issued. That's how it's going to be, right? Um, this is the sort of question I'm not going to answer. Will Ankara invite me for an interview? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not going to answer it. Uh, I'm Albert from Ghana. Albert from Ghana? I didn't know it was you, Albert from Ghana. I think there's probably more than one Albert in Ghana, but... I have my DB, DB, visa DB 2022, thanks to you. Crikey, you're one of the 194 people that have been um, that have been issued already? Albert, that's awesome. And in Ghana. Now, Accra Embassy and I have had a bit of a tough relationship in the past because, you know, I don't want to piss off any Ghanaians. I, you know, I understand that people, are, people in Ghana are very proud of their country young men typically, and they get very boisterous and aggressive with me when I say anything bad about Ghana, um, whatever. But there is a lot of fraud goes on in Ghana. And the consequence of the high levels of fraud, and please don't tell me there's not a lot of fraud goes on in Ghana, that would be stupid. Um, but the, 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 and there's a lot of fraud goes on in, in the DV process. In fact, if you, I, I predicted this years ago, like, eight, nine years ago, I noticed that the number of um, entries in Ghana rocketed, skyrocketed, and the derivative rate massively changed uh, and lent towards um, single people applying. And in the old days, they weren't caught that often, but it, what it was was a, a bunch of, frankly, bad agents scamming everybody um, and doing entries in, in Ghana uh, you know, speculatively, to then say, you know, they would just register 100 people that, you know, sometimes didn't even know they were being registered, or 1,000 people or whatever. They would get college, you know, information from colleges and that sort of thing and just register people. Bullshit, absolute nonsense. They set up um, street uh, booths where they could register people. And, you know, some of them, some of the agents were good, but fraud seems to be a way of life for some people. And um, and so in many cases, those people were abused by uh, the agents, right? But anyway, what it meant was that the Ghana embassy were so used to seeing bullshit applications that they just started refusing all sorts of applications. And um, there was a time when uh, they were only approving one case in eight cases in Accra. They were denying cases. And frankly, they denied some good cases. There were plenty of cases that were fraud, for sure. I mean, you know, no problem with that. Um, but they were, I've dealt with specifically, I've dealt with um, specific cases that I know to be accurate. I verified documents. I verified people's stories personally. Um, I argued on their behalf with um, Accra Embassy. Um, but still, people got denied from Accra because Accra was just, you know, being horrible. But anyway, Albert, congratulations to you if that's not the case and uh, and you've got your visa. I'm, I'm thrilled for you. Uh, we need some good Ghanaians. I think it was... Um, was it Ghanaian? There was a case a few years ago of a, of a young man that died rescuing, uh, rescuing some people from a fire. It was a very moving story about a DV lottery guy from Africa. I think it was from Ghana. And this guy basically just, you know, very brave young man, gave his life literally 
trying to rescue others from a fire in America. He was an immigrant to America. And um, it was about the, the, I saw that story about the same time that Trump had said something about shithole countries and, uh, and, and was displaying his outward racism towards people of Africa and others. And um, so I, I created a blog article years ago, I think it was about three or four years ago, uh, where I said, yeah, these are, these are your shithole uh, immigrants, Trump. You know, they're the sort of people that rush into a burning building to try and to try and save people, come out and go back into a burning bu building and are burnt to death because they're trying to save someone. Um, you know, immigrants, there's some immigrants are hardworking, decent people. I am one. <laughs> right. So anyway. <clears throat> All right. So uh, there are two dates. Carlos is asking about the two dates. I'm glad you're asking that. I wanted to talk about that. <clears throat> the two dates you're referring to, let me just pull up a file. Uh, there are two dates in the file um, in the SEAC data. Um, and where where is my file? There, there we go. They're the, they're the submit, in the SEAC data, we're talking about the submit date and the status date, uh, the two dates. Right, so the submit date is the date that that person entered the lottery. Um, and, uh, you know, in the, during the entry period, which is quite interesting. I've taken that data before and I've plotted it to prove um, that the selection is random no matter when you enter the lottery during the open period. Some people speculated it was, you know, you got advantage if you entered early or you got advantage if you entered on the last day or, you know, these sort of things. Not the case at all. It's completely random. It doesn't matter which day you enter on. But I've used that data in the past to plot the data and demonstrate that. Um, selectees are chosen from all over the, uh, the date range. Um, but anyway, that first date, submit date, which you see on the SEAC data, that's the date you entered the lottery. The second date um, is interesting too, it's the status date. Um, the status date is the last time the, uh, the file is touched. And so what we see now, for example, if a case is at ready, and um, and it's got a date, let's say I'm looking at here, this one is uh, AF case number three, AF3, right? Um, it's entry, uh, submit date was 24th of October, 2020. That's the day that person entered the, the lottery. And the status date is 22nd of December, 21. And that case is ready, right? So that was the date that that person got the 2NL. That's basically what happened there. Actually, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit incorrect. It's the date that the embassy marked the case as ready, having received the case from uh, from KCC. So it's a little bit after the two NL, but it's um, it it helps us track when um, two NLs are sent and that sort of thing. Now, when that case is then interviewed, um, that date will get updated. Okay, uh, refused or a issued or AP, that date will get updated. So that's that's the answer to your question. Thanks for asking. Um, this question comes up a lot. <laughs> Are there supposed to be any delay if the DS-260 is unlocked? I've answered this, I think, probably 48,000 times, right? So let me just say it again. <laughs> um, in general, please understand that delay is better than denial, right? So if you need to unlock your case, go ahead and unlock your case. The sooner you do that, the better, right? Please don't do the moronic thing that I saw people doing a few months ago based on information they were getting in uh, in these ch channels and forums and that sort of thing of not unlocking their case because they were concerned about being delayed. That's frankly a stupid thing to do. You need to unlock your case if you've got a serious change in, that you need to make in your, uh, in your uh, DS-260. However, um, only some changes you make in the DS-260 will actually cause you any delay. Right. So if you go in there and you change, let's say you made a mistake on the, you know, you were married 22 years ago, but you put the 9th of July instead of the 10th of July. Frankly, nobody gives a shit what you did 22 years ago. They only want to know if you're married. Right. And number one, I wouldn't even bother updating that. If you, if you put the 9th of July and it's supposed to be the 10th of July, who cares? Right. Nobody cares. Now, uh, that might be more relevant if that date is, is more recent, right? But 22 years ago, who cares? It doesn't matter. 
So number one, I wouldn't unlock for that. But number two, if you did unlock for that, it wouldn't make any difference to your case. It wouldn't delay processing. Now, on the other hand, if you get married and you unlock because you got married or you have a baby or so, something like that, those are significant changes and they could cause a little bit of a delay. But you're better off to unlock and add your spouse to make sure you both get visas rather than being in the awful situation. I've seen people where they don't, add a child to the case or they don't add their spouse to the case they turn up at the interview in late september in uh in some year they try and get the visa for the kid that they didn't add to the ds260 that's now six months old and they suddenly realize that they're going to get a visa for the parents but not for the new kid for example or not for the spouse or whatever they didn't do in terms of unlocking so you know it's important to unlock for important things right and um, if you make a mistake with your name, make a change, right? Your name is important. It's important information. Your education history, a couple of dates here and there, who cares? Your, you know, if you change your job, don't unlock for that. There's no need to change your uh, DS260 because you swapped your job. You were a baker, now you're a postman. Who cares? Nobody cares. You're leaving that job anyway. You're moving to America. Nobody cares what you do for a job, right? Uh, you move ad your home address from one city, you know, from one address in, in Berlin to another address in Berlin. Who cares, right? Nobody cares, <laughs> right? So but just understand there are some things that you should not be unlocking for. But if you do unlock, only some things will cause a delay. Okay, so that's 48,001 times I've, I've answered that question. Uh, do you have any information about the U.S. Embassy in Khartoum, Sudan? Are they accepting any 2022 winners? Again, another embassy that hasn't called me. Sorry about that. Uh, good evening, sir. I have a question. If I use the wrong email during the DV lottery application, is it possible to collect that error? I think mean correct that error while filling the DS260 form. Yes, go ahead and do that. When you're filling in the DS260 form, put your new accurate email address in and you'll get emails to that new address. Okay, do that. Uh, anything news for Iraqi selectees? No, nothing, nothing new. Uh, can you send your Instagram page? Mine. Um, I have an Instagram account. My wife is really good on Insta Instagram. She's a realtor and she's a lovely person. So she, she, uh, and she's pretty. Um, so she has an Instagram page and makes beautiful pictures. I'm not pretty, as you may have noticed. And so I don't do very much with Instagram, frankly. Um, but I have, uh, you know, I have a blog and I have, you know, BritSimonSays.com. I have this channel. I talk on uh, Twitter and God help me. I'm now engaging with people on the global um, global forum, whatever that is, in Telegram, uh, which was driving me nuts before Christmas, but has been a little bit better, you know, just recently. Uh, people are starting to listen, I think. I, I don't know. We'll see. Um, could you sp please explain more on the CX 2022 data Excel? What does it mean, the submission date? Already did that. Um, happy New Year to you. Uh, Will go plaintiffs get prioritized? We don't know yet, um, and we won't be able to, you know, find anything out until uh, until about April, March, or April. Okay, we're watching watching live live from Africa. You know, my my wife uh, my wife is um, a bit of a cook. She's a vegan, uh, which means we have almost no meat at home. Um, you know, I'm I'm a meat eater, but she's a vegan. My daughter is sort of semi vegan. Um, she would love to do recipes um, from around the world, vegan recipes. I mean, she would prefer vegan, and that's not always possible in many countries, but um, she would love to do that. So, I, you know, one day I really should do more in gathering stories from people, whether it's for, you know, recipes from Ghana, you know, Ghanaian cuisine or, you know, uh, Sudanese cuisine or whatever. Uh, whether it's that or whether it's just sort of showing, you know, here's where people live, I, th I think it would be fascinating. I've been working with people, um, you know, in many countries for many years, right? And um, I rarely get to know the stories and what it's like in those countries, and I would like to know more. Um, and I think it would be fascinating. But um, but anyway, let me, you know, thanks for letting me know you're watching from Africa. Uh, that's awesome. I'm doing great. Thank you, Moses. Moses. You're, you're kind of important. You, you've done some important stuff in the in the Bible there, man. Um, you were kind of important character in that in that story. Thank you for that. 
Mr. Britain, <laughs> Mr. Britain, you know that my, you know, Simon Britain, Britain's not actually my last name, right? It was it was a pretend name. I just thought it was funny because I'm British, right? If you didn't get the joke. This year, max number is 27302. That's the EU number, right? Always be clear. You should quote the number and the region um, together because you, you there could be in Africa 27302, right? The, the you know they could be the same number in each region anyway your case number is 23k but this year uh, this number is high can i have any chance right okay i wish i'd read to the end because i would know that i wasn't going to answer that question what you can do is you can go on zarthisius's site and you can see how many cases are in front of you and how many cases are behind you right uh, and how many and therefore how many people are in front of you and how many people are behind you and you can do some sort of com computation calculation to see whether you feel like you're going to get a chance or not. But the reality is the numbers and the, you know, uh, the SEAC data actually means nothing compared to, um, you know, the cases going on, uh, you know, the COVID cases going on, the closures of the embassies and everything else. That's really what your, your chances depend on. If some country has 5,000 selectees, and the embassy has to shut down, those 5,000 people in that country have a much tougher time to apply for their, their DV lottery visa. So whilst it's a horrible thing to think about, their loss could be your gain, right? Uh, on the other hand, you might have a low case number, you might have a case number with, which mathematically you think has a good chance, and all of a sudden your embassy closes, and then you're screwed, right? And there's nothing gonna help you with that. I mean, you know. You'll fight, you'll struggle, you'll try and move your case. Of course you will. But um, but in reality, it could destroy your chances for no fault of your own. It's just the way it works out. So, you know, that's why I don't predict. Okay. Um, you have a high case number from Asia, uh, from Asia, which is around 23,000, which is pretty high in Asia. You know, have a look at the data. You can see how high that really is. If the visa bulletin goes current, not very likely. Uh, will I receive an email from KCC if there is no submission of documents now? And when you say an email, you mean 2 l So again, you're asking for a prediction with your case number, et cetera. I'm not going to answer the question, but uh, I will use it to address um, if it goes current, right? We don't know that regions are going to go current this year. As I mentioned earlier, in Asia, Nepal and Iran really are going to drive what happens in Asia. So um, there are, let me just explain that a little bit more. The, uh, where am I? Okay. Let me show you this, uh, this screen. Okay. So uh, here's a screen. Here's some stuff you should look at. Can I make that bigger? Oh, I can make that bigger. That's nice. Um, okay. There are in Asia, oh, I've gotten a bit too big now. And I'm a bit too moved over there. There we go. Um, in Asia, there are um, there are twenty four thousand people selected. There are thirty eight hundred, roughly. I'm just just from memory, so I don't know exactly uh, the numbers. Oh, maybe I'll get the numbers. Hang on a second. The numbers are thirty eight hundred from Iran. I think. Where is it? Sorry, not from Iran. Nepal. Nepal is thirty eight oh two, and Iran is fifty seven three nine, nearly six thousand. Right. So between those two countries. There are 10,000 of the 24,000 selectees in just two countries, okay? Uh, rougher numbers. I mean, 3,800 and 5,700, 9,500 people. And those people, just put them to one side. The rest of Asia, what I'd like to call the rest of Asia, is all the other cases. So that's 14,500 people, right? If... If Iran takes, if if Nepal takes their their limit, which would be about thirty five to thirty seven hundred visas, if they if they take that, and Iran takes let's say two thousand visas, then there's going to be uh, only three thousand visas or so left for the rest of Asia, and there's there's fourteen and a half thousand people who who uh, want those visas, right? So you could roughly say, okay then uh, a quarter of the rest of Asia are going to get visas because uh, the lion's share is going to be taken by Nepal and Iran. But if Iran only gets 500 visas or 1,000 visas, there'll be a different story. 
if Kathmandu Embassy doesn't get his act together and open soon, there'll be a different story in Nepal. So, you know, I can calculate mathematically, and so can you. But do you know what's going to happen in Kathmandu? I don't. Do you know what's going to happen with the Iranian uh, cases being scheduled in the, uh, the three embassies where they go? I don't know what's going to happen because COVID crisis could shut down travel. They could close down borders, etc. We don't know, right? So, um, so yeah, it's it's a difficult question to answer, um, and frankly, I don't even think we should try <laughs> uh, because it's too difficult a question to answer. But anyway, that's that's a bit of an explanation. I did, by the way, while I'm on this sheet, let me show you this. Uh, zoom out a little bit. I um, I'd shown this sheet before. Oh, how do I do this? Yeah. Yeah, I'd shown this sheet before, uh, and I, I've just added these three columns yesterday and today with the actual data from SIAC. Um, but previously, I had taken the number of selectees from, from each um, country, and I had used the 2021 observed derivative rate to calculate an estimate how many cases we would have in each region, right? And actually, I got those case estimates pretty accurate. You can look at my numbers, 29,917 was my estimate, and it's actually 29,679 for Africa. Uh, 12,500 was my estimate for Asia, and it's actually 12,514, 12, so I was 12 cases out. You know, my, my estimates across the board, 19,000 versus 19,133, my estimates were pretty good. I was pleased with that. My uh, I, I then plotted a number of other things, and I've explained this data before, so I won't go through it again. But I used two different methods in order to predict the highest case numbers we would see. Not cutoffs. We're not talking about cutoffs. We're talking about trying to predict the highest case number we would see. And across the board, I was overly optimistic. My my numbers, my estimates were too high. And um, and what it showed me is that the density uh, has changed a little bit, generally because of the the countries. Um, you know, but. I don't want to get too technical on it, but um, but anyway, it, it was interesting that the numbers came through lower than I, I had suspected. Oh, people have uh, asked, by the way, I've heard this morning someone's pointed out there's um, there's an AS case, I think, at 37K, something like that, 37XXX. People have asked about the outliers. An outlier is a case that... Uh, is wildly different to the rest of the range. So, for example, there is a case number of one, 177,045, something like that, uh, which is a real case. It's a real case that does exist. Uh, I'm absolutely not design, uh, denying it exists. Frank, uh, who does one of these data sets on, on CEC, has checked every case between, uh, between our known highest case number, 63,959 in Africa, and the 177. Actually, he's gone to 180,000. There are no more outliers. So, you know, we get to 63,959, and um, and someone at Department of State switched off the selection system for Africa. But randomly, <laughs> case number 177,000 gets added to the list. We don't know why that happens. It happens every year. Every year, literally, I mean, people, you know, don't freak out about it. It's nothing that Trump did. It's nothing that Biden did. It's nothing. It doesn't destroy our confidence in the SEAC data. Nothing like that. But there are always these outliers, um, randomly high cases, either high above the whole range for the region, or they're high above the range for a cutoff country, a limited country. So Nepal is a limited country um, uh, where the selectee, numbers in Nepal uh, and uh, Iran is the same, um, where the selectees don't continue into the high case number ranges. But then randomly, there'll be some case at, you know, uh, 27,000 from Nepal, whereas the rest of the cases from Nepal are all, all below 14,000, all below 13,000, right? So um, we don't know why it happens. Uh, it's a glitch. It's a bug in their selection process, but it doesn't really mean anything. Um, and, you know, that particular case, the 177K case, could theoretically get interviewed um, uh, if the region were to go current, right? It could possibly happen. Um, but obviously that, you know, th there's not a bunch of cases in between. Anyway, I just wanted to address that. Uh, and, you know, perhaps that was interesting. 
uh, to some of you. Okay, so um, I think I've answered your question there pretty comprehensively. If somebody plays the lottery as an asylum seeker in a country and he wins, must he the winner return to his country of origin to process the lottery? No, you you can process you can process your case wherever you happen to be at that time. That's the same for everyone. It's nothing to do with asylum seekers. So um, and then there's you know all sorts of stories. I mean, you can apply. People think it's important which country you apply from. I've never understood why people think that's important. So. You know, they have someone apply for the DV lottery from America because they think it will give them more chance. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, or they, you know, they apply from the lottery. They've moved to Australia. They're from Nepal. Because they're in Australia, they put down Australia as their region, uh, country of chargeability, which gets them disqualified, of course. But, you know, but they're surprised that the place where they're at has... It really has nothing to do with your case. It doesn't affect your chargeability. It doesn't affect how you process. You ch you process where you live. Your status being an asylum seeker in some third country really doesn't make much difference. The only thing that you might be asked is to prove that you didn't do anything illegal in your process of asylum in that country. All right. So, uh, and it would be unusual to say the least for a uh, for an embassy to ask for um you know sort of residence documents etc as a condition of a dv lottery win they shouldn't be doing that carlos uh on the csv file yeah we've already answered that what do you think of the few cases ready in Cairo embassy however egypt has six thousand and five. yeah you know so okay let me go back to that question um we've got 2800 uh scheduled interviews for january and february roughly uh, 2,800 people, um, about 15, 1,700 cases. Um, so that's a pretty low number. I'm disappointed with that number. But in the next few days, I expect more 2NLs to come out for, Jan uh, for February interviews, not for January interviews. I don't expect any more. Uh, I mean, it could happen, but I don't expect any more to come out for January at this point. So, there, but there could be some more 2NL sent out over the next few days for February interviews. And what I said this morning <coughs> on a chat somewhere, oh, a message to Jesse Bless, is I, I want to see about a thousand, a thousand more cases being scheduled uh, in uh, in February. At least a thousand people, which would be about 500 cases, but preferably a thousand cases. Right? That would sort of somewhat redeem. Uh, the fairly poor showing in January and February so far. And then, as I said yesterday, I think we need to start seeing volume of around about 3,000 cases, which is nearly 6,000 people, um, being scheduled each, each month between March and September. If we don't get that sort of volume, we're not going to get close to uh, the 55,000. Even at that sort of volume, we won't get close to the, to the 55,000. But 3,000 uh, 3, cases, let's say 6,000 people being interviewed for seven months, that's 42,000 people. Roughly 10% will be refused. Add in January, February, let's say we got 2,000 from that, we'd have about 40,000 uh, issued visas. That would be pretty good from this mess, from the mess we're in, that would be pretty good. right? And some people are going to say, oh, no, they should issue all 55,000 visas. Well, grow up. That isn't going to happen, right? Uh, you know, we've got to understand there's no point wishing for fairies to come along and save everyone. That's not the way life works, right? So, a, a you know, if they can do 3,000 a month, they can get to 40,000, right? If they could do 4,000 a month, which I don't believe they can do consistently, but if they could do that, we might be able to push 50,000. Um, you know, it, it, it would be close to that, but... 4,000 a month is more than I've seen them do pre-pandemic on a consistent basis, right? Maybe they've done it once or twice, but not consistently. And, you know, right now there's more embassies that are either closed or there are limited opening status, et cetera. And so I don't think we're going to see 4,000 a month, but I'm hoping to see 3,000 a month, 2,500 a month. I mean, that, that would show good effort from KCC um, and from the embassy. So that's what I want to see. I mean, I want I want to see four thousand. I'm just I'm just not a dreamer, right? Uh, as I explained yesterday. Um, okay. Uh, 
Uh, Vlado, um, do you need a, qu a letter from your host for the interview? Typically not. There was a thing that was happening in Nepal a few years ago, and I think it still goes on to an extent, to an extent today. Whereas in lieu of the I-134 or showing finances, savings, personal savings, people would show what they described as a welcome letter. It was called a welcome letter in Nepal, and it was commonly accepted, very usually accepted at the Nepal embassy. So um, it might, you know, it might be something worth carrying, um, but an I-134 is a prescribed format that if you've got someone who is in America who's willing to give you a welcome letter and they've got a job and they earn some income, then they should, frankly, feel happy to fill out an I-134. If they know you that well, if they're a friend, if they're a family member or something like that, fill out an I-134. And that I-134 is much more valuable to have uh, available. Um, it, it, it satisfies, if it meets the requirements, it satisfies the uh, public charge thing straight away. Okay, so uh, get that. And, and at the end of the day, it's just a matter of having it on hand to avoid the possibility of denial uh, or delay on, you know, on your case because you don't, you don't have all the documents ready. So, you know, but at the end of the day, if you want to take a letter from your uh, from your friend or your, your host, go ahead and do that. It doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, it won't harm, right? But an I one thirty four would be better. Um, fully vaccinated for U.S. immigration mean two or three dose. It's actually it's it's actually based on your country. That when you go when you go to the uh, medical checkup um, for the DV lottery process the physician will administer any needed vaccinations that he or she believes you need, right? Including uh, checking your COVID vaccination status, right? Now, the COVID vaccine may not be available in your country, um, in which case it's not actually a requirement of, uh, of entering the USA later, right? Because there is an assumption for an immigrant case, such as a DV lottery case, that you've had your medical interview and that whatever uh, vaccinations you needed, including COVID, that, that you needed and were available have been administered, right? And so um, immigrant cases don't actually have to prove that they have been vaccinated because that process happens at the medical. Now, if the vaccine is available, you're an idiot if you don't get it. You're an idiot if you don't get it, right? Let me just be very clear. Please don't come at me with anti-vax bullshit, um, you know, because honestly, you, if you think that, you're not clever enough to enter the USA. We've got enough morons here already. Thank you very much. <laughs> we don't need more. Um, so, you know, please do and go, go and get your COVID uh, vaccine if it's available to you. But if it's not available to you, or if the number of vaccines available to you in your country is different to that, uh, which is available in the States. Don't worry about it. it the, the physician who does your interview will, uh, will know what to do, okay? Um, does, is that true? Hi, Britt. Does, is that true? That the highest case number in Africa for DV 2022 is 177K. I explained that already. It's an outlier, right? Don't, don't start freaking out saying there are 177,000 people selected and all this sort of stuff, please. <laughs> It's just a random case, uh, you know, at a very high case number. It doesn't mean anything. Brett, I don't know how you do this, but I just want to say thank you. Oh, that's lovely. You've been exceedingly helpful uh, answering repeated questions. We are grateful. Thank you, Prince. And a genuine um, royal family member on my on my uh, live session here. Thank you, Prince. <laughs> I'm winner 2022. My case is almost 16,000. Great. Good for you. Uh, hi, bro. I, can't, I know you can't anticipate. When could certain case number go current? So, okay, you know you can't. I'm not sure what your question is there, Dean. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Uh, what the news about 2020? Already answered that at the beginning. Please go back. Best regards from Poland. Uh, from Matt, Matt, Mattka. Cool. You know, I think... Uh, Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> one of the one of the people that is providing the data um, on the SEAC data is Polish, and I work with. Actually, I've got my house in the UK rented out to a Polish person, uh, friend of mine. I've known for years. I've moved from 
the UK to the States in 2014, and I kept my house there um, for investment purposes, but I rented it to a friend who happened to be from Poland. Uh, and I work with a couple of Polish people. Great, great. They make great software engineers for some reason. I think it's, you know, it's kind of like Ukrainians uh, or anyone from the Russian, um, you know, previously Russian countries uh, where they go through these sort of math universities. Um, you know, there's some smart, uh, some smart cookies in those Eastern Bloc countries. And as I say, yeah, I think a couple of the people actually involved in the SEAC data and providing you information, uh, they come from those countries. Um, do you know how KCC process DS260 after documents removal, or do they schedule you uh, only submitted DS260? Okay, so this goes back to a question I've sort of answered a few times, and I do want people to understand this point, so I'll repeat it again. Um, the document procedure has been removed, and I'm thrilled about that. It was a bloody awful, um, it, was a, it was a mess. It was introduced in 2017, 2018, and it caused problems. So I'm pleased that it's gone, at least in 2022, um, because it was really detrimental. Um, now, that does not mean that there is not a status called, you know, documentarily qualified. There is still a status of DQ. There was, prior to the document procedure being implemented, a status of being DQ. There is a, it's a general principle in the immigration law that a case has to be documentarily qualified in order to be interviewed, right? It's the same in non-DV cases. It's the same thing. The only thing that's changed is that since they removed the document procedure, the process by which you become documentarily qualified has changed. The requirements for being DQ have changed, right? But they still do something with the DS-260. Now, do they do the same level of processing that they did before? I don't know. Do they have all the security checks in place? I don't know. I don't think they're going to let the security checks go. So I say I don't know, but I, I suspect they still do the security checks. So I think there's still some sort of level of validation of the DS-260. But the information coming out, you know, the published statements from KCC and from Department of State are contradictory about that. Sometimes they say that, you know, just having submitted your DS-260 means you're ready for an interview. And sometimes they talk about processing. Your DS-260 is still being processed. I think the fact that not everybody is receiving DQ letters is proof that they're doing some sort of level of processing with the DS-260. Otherwise, everybody would be DQ right now. Um, so, but, but the whole processing process, you know, uh, has got much faster since they removed the document um, procedure. And that was only on December 9th, three weeks ago. So give it a little bit of time, give it a few more weeks, and we're, we'll pretty much be ignoring this whole question of DQ, uh, because every case will become documentarily qualified within a short period of time. Okay, it's much faster for them to do that than uh, you know, than, than we think. As I've mentioned before, I've shown documentation from court um, documents, court um, uh, declarations, sworn statements that show that they can process 7,000 cases in a month. Cases, uh, you know, like, you know, principal selectees. So they can do a lot of DST60 processing in a relatively short time. So, um, but anyway, um, we don't know the, the exact details, and I'm speculating a little bit, but I'm speculating with some evidence, okay? Okay. Uh, oh, here, Dean, you're asking a question. Oh, you're not going to do that, Dean. <laughs> what about my case, my friend's case number? Not even your number, AS2700, that went, went current. Um, but no, okay, so it's sort, of an, it's sort of one of these questions of when will I get the interview. I don't know when the, your friend is going to get his interview. He just needs to be patient. Um, you, it depends on a couple of things. It depends on the, the embassy itself. Is your friend's embassy interviewing or not? Um, uh, if they are, are they embassy, uh, is the embassy accepting full capacity or not? How many people are scheduled or want to be scheduled at that embassy? Um, when did your friend submit the DS-260? When was it processed, if at all? Did he receive um, DQ? Right, it's a ton of things. So I, I, you know, individual cases, Dean. I don't, I don't try and predict what will happen in individual cases. Right, just be patient. 
And that's what you need to tell your friend. Eraldo, Eraldo. Uh, EU 20,000, my passport is submitted, so it expires in May. Should I hurry up and make a new one and reopen the DS-260? Just take the new and the old uh, passport to the interview. There's no need to reopen for that. Hi, Simon. Given the age of density drops off to like 20 to 25%, I think it's about 22 23%, holes after 14,000. Can we expect them to move a lot quicker through the rest of the numbers um, after that on the visa bulletin? Yes, sort of. The effect of lower density means that they have to reveal more case numbers to yield more uh, DQ cases. So yes, that your general understanding is correct. The VB can move faster after that point. However, um, Asia has three separate numbers, right? It's got the Asia number, it's got the Nepal number, and the Iran number, right? In the VB, there's there's country specific numbers. So they can control those three at different paces. They could, for example, uh, they could go current to 20,000 for Asia. I'm just making this up. They could go current to 20,000 for Asia and still have Nepal limited to 9,000, right? That would mean roughly 75% of cases in Nepal are current and 25% are not. And the 20,000 in Asia would affect the rest of Asia more than it affects Nepal and Iran. So, you know, um, what will actually happen, I can't really predict. There's, there's too many other factors that I can't really predict. But in general, yes, lower density can lead to very high uh, case number movement. So in previous years, back to the good old days, when things were working a bit more sort of reasonably, we would see, for example, in Africa, there would be, you know, 5,000 increase, 8,000 increase, and then density drops, and all of a sudden we see increases on a monthly basis of like 15,000 and 18,000 on a monthly basis because the density had dropped. People didn't understand what the hell was happening because they weren't paying attention, but... Um, but yeah, that's what it meant. It, the lower density led to faster VB movement, sort of, right? But that's back in the old days when everything else was working well. We're not really in that position today. Uh, Raluca says, Happy New Year. What do you think about 2NLs being sent to people before they're current? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think it was just a mistake. There were some cases um, scheduled for interview in January, I think it was, maybe in December. Um, uh, that weren't current, you're, you're correct in saying that, shouldn't have happened. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. Uh, those cases will either be rescheduled by the embassy or they'll, the embassy could keep the schedule and then put, put those people on AP until their case number is current. Um, the latter isn't actually so great because you go for your interview, let's say you're scheduled for interview at the end of January, two weeks or so before that you should have your medical and then if your case number actually gets current in, let's say, February or March, you can't be issued until February or March, but by then your medical is already two or three months old, and so you'll get a reduced amount of validity on your visa. You get less time. Um, so it's not ideal, um, and it shouldn't have happened, but it, it didn't happen. I mean, it's, let's face it, it's not, we're not talking a 1,000 cases like that. We're talking of a handful of cases like that. Um, so, you know, let's not get freaked out about it. And it happened because they switched things around very quickly. The December 9th, you know, I mean, they just got confused. They moved people around within KCC. And I should imagine they had someone inexperienced who kind of picked up a, uh, a case and, and scheduled it without knowing what the hell they were doing. That's all, right? And, you know, it happens. Um, DB2020 AP, what's the fate of them? You have to just wait, same as everybody else, right? Um, DB2020 is all protected by Gomez, right? So there are 9,095 visas reserved in the Gomez case for all the cases that were, uh, that, you know, that were going through at that time. A case that has already been interviewed at the embassy, such as a case that's on AP, if AP is finished now, um, has a good chance, right? But you have to just wait for uh, for the whole process to go through and for those uh, system changes to be made. Okay, so just wait for now. Um, not current, yeah. AF24,000, not a particularly high number. You're patiently waiting, submitted. Yeah, fingers crossed. Absolutely, Prince. Fingers crossed for you. 
Um, any news about Afghanistan strategies? We should transfer the case to, yeah. So, um, number one, in Afghanistan, you have to think about your safety. Is it safe for you to travel to another country, right? If it is, then get the hell out of Dodge. Go to the other country, move there, right? Find some way that you can be there because, frankly, um, having information lying around that you've applied for and won the, the American visa lottery, uh, it's probably not very good for your health in Afghanistan at, at the moment, right? So um, if you can travel to another country, do that, first of all. Secondly, if you can reschedule your case in another country, um, then do that. Some people have been doing that in as Islamabad, um, Pakistan. Um, cases have been scheduled in Pakistan. And because Pakistan has no ability to enter the lottery themselves, <laughs> that is obvious that that, that Pakistan um, uh, activity is from neighboring countries such as Afghanistan probably is. And I know of some, some cases which uh, have managed to get moved there. So, you know, ask for, uh, and hopefully you'll receive a, a, a change of your interview location to Pakistan. And you've got a good chance of getting interviewed that way. But do it Number one, make sure you're safe, right? Um, and the other thing you can do, if you want, is you can wait for the government to sort it out. And then, then if you're assigned to Afghanistan, they will then know there's that sort of group of people that need to be moved, and they'll move the whole group, or they'll try and move many of the people in that group to another embassy. You can try and do that if you want. But we're getting to the point where you should do something if it's possible. If your case number is low, you should take your future into your own hands, right? Don't rely on others all the time. Okay. Uh, I think we talked about that one already. Uh, any idea when it will become current? You're Afghan living in Turkey. No idea. I'm not going to answer it. Uh, do we know if KCC still processes DS260? We talked about that. Happy New Year to you, Moses. Um, you were in Qatar three years, two consecutive years, one year, 90 days, renewable visa. Had to exit every 90 days. Um, they issued for serial period, and sh I don't know what that means. But if you've got a police certificate, present that. It may not be complete. It may not cover the full time of your stay. Um, but you just have to explain that in the interview if asked. They probably won't even ask, to be honest. Um, according to me, what's the future of the BBB? Yet something, uh, another thing I'm not going to try and predict. I have no idea. Like, you know, it's a very complex um, set of negotiations. It's an, uh, the BBB is an enormous bill. It's got all sorts of stuff being thrown into one pot, right? And that's ambitious. And I wish that the Democrats had enough of a majority to be able to push that through. But they don't. They only have a slim, they, they're in the Senate, there are 50 senators on the Democrat side and 50 on the Republican side, which gives them um, the ability to push some legislation through because they have the tiebreaker, they have uh, the vice president um, as a tiebreaker, but it's not a good margin. So as just recently happened, one Democrat withholds his vote and the whole thing just gets stalled. There's nothing can happen, right? Um, that's the political process here. It drives me mad when people say, oh, you know, the Democrats, you know, Joe Biden promised to do this, he promised to do that. Yeah, but you've got to take into account the political process. The political process is, uh, go ahead, hon. The, the political process is that, you know, there's a voting system. It's not just what Joe Biden wants to do or what the Democrats want to do. They have to get things passed in a voting system and they don't have strong majorities. And they're going to have less of a majority, perhaps no majority at all, after the next elections, because that's generally what happens. The, the party that's in power tends to lose power in the subsequent elections. Um, so, you know, it's hard for them to get anything pushed through. And then with a bill such as the BBB that's got so much stuff in it, so many different things in it, it's very easy for someone to find one thing they don't want to agree with or two or three things they don't want to agree with and just not vote for the whole thing. So 
I suspect the BBB is probably not going anywhere. I think that's the way I'm leaning. I think Charles Cook um, talks about this. He puts his confidence level at about 3%. Um, I'm generally optimistic about things in life, but BBB going through, I'm not very optimistic about. We might see that legislation pulled out and put into a different bill. Uh, perhaps one that's easier to agree. That's a possibility. That's more likely possibility, to be honest. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's tough. Uh, didn't receive a message for an interview. Just be, uh, is it Georges? Uh, Gersh, Georges? Um, just be patient, right? You'll get it. Uh, if your embassy is working, oh yeah, it's Egypt. They haven't been doing very much. But the good thing about Egypt <coughs> is that they have the ability to process a hell of a lot of cases, big embassy. So, um, and they're very, they're, they're very um, approval happy. They approve a lot of cases in, in Egypt as well. So, you know, if they get going, they can make a lot of change pretty quickly. And they could quickly become one of the highest volume um, embassies, right? That, Kathmandu, you know, those are the sort of embassies that push a lot of cases through. Is it beneficial to change interview location if we're 100% sure that the, un that the un other embassy is working faster? Would there be any setbacks to the decision? Right. Switching embassies is risky. It can get screwed up by the embassies, right? And you don't want to do that if you're not sure. I also, I was asked this question by someone uh, yesterday, I think it was. And this guy was like Africa 53,000. And he's pissed off with one embassy. He wants to move to another embassy based on what he's seeing today. But I pointed out that Unless you know, uh, you know, if, if your case number is not current and it's going to be current, let's say, in four months' time, do you know what the situation is going to be in four months' time? Do you know that your uh, your embassy is not going to be working well then and the other one is going to be working well? Do you know that? I don't know that. How would you know that? Right? You don't know that. And so you're perhaps taking a risk. Number one, there's there's risks in the process itself because the embassies can screw it up. And number two, you're making an assumption that the other location is going to be better at some future date in the, you know, in the either near term or long term future. We don't know, right? And so it's risky. If you want to take that risk, it's up to you. But you can't be switching back and forth like it's, you know, hairdressing appointments. It's not like that, right? It's a, it's a big deal. So, um, you know, you've got to make your own mind. I'm not going to, I'm not going to push you one way or the other. Uh, my friend from Uganda won the 2020 lottery, but when the government shut down the embassies, he was never called for interviews. It, uh, he is still having any chance. There's a few people. It depends, Philip, on his particular situation. There's about 9,000 re reserve visas in a lawsuit called Gomez, and he might be able to get a visa from that, right? But that's very unusual. In a normal year, I'd just be saying, no, there's no chance. The year ended, right? It's only because of the lawsuits that we're continuing to talk about 2020 and 2021. Pedro, how you doing? Not it's only on my side, but your camera keeps, oh, camera lens keeps changing. It's moving focus in and out. I'm probably, is it when I'm moving? I don't know. I, I need to spend a little bit of time uh, working out this stuff, but um, uh, blurring, yeah, so it's going out of focus. Thanks for letting me know that, Pedro. I'll have a look at that later, but I won't do it right now. Anyway, me in, in blurred soft focus is probably the best way to be honest. <laughs> Uh, okay, any idea for AS? Yes, no, I've got no idea. You're an Afghan living in Turkey. I think you've already asked this. I have no idea. I like Turkey. I think it's great with roast potatoes and, and cranberry sauce. But other than that, I have no idea. Um, so there you go. Pedro Manuel <clears throat> received an email on November 23rd. While I was preparing to send them to KCC, I received another email for interview. Is it important to send the documents anyway? No, don't don't bother sending them. You'll take the documents to the interview. That's all. Documents are no longer required. Jahid, uh, in when it's from Azerbaijan and Georgia, deeply concerned about slow working of Tbilisi embassy. Is there anything we can do? Not really. Um, there is one of the lawyers, Jesse Bless. Uh, Curtis Curtis Morrison has already filed a an embassy specific um, lawsuit for uh, for Baghdad with about 25 selectees. And Jesse Bless is clearly looking you know, at the situation as well. Um, and I think he may um, file a, an embassy specific case at some point. 
and Curtis may file more and other lawyers may file more. Um, so if Tbilisi continue to not work, then that might be a possibility. But don't forget, the blockages that were plaguing this, this process only got unlocked uh, three weeks ago, right? It's too early right now to start lamenting that we, you know, this embassy isn't doing anything, this embassy isn't doing anything. Wait, wait for a few weeks at least. Let's see the next batch of 2NLs that will come out for February interviews. I would say you'd even want to wait until we see March interviews and see what the embassy is doing then. After that point, yeah, we'll, you know, maybe we'll be suing at that at that point, individual embassies. We'll see. Um, what does M MVC mean? I've said this, I don't know, a thousand times a day. MVC is the starting status for all cases. It doesn't matter whether you are, whether you haven't submitted your DS-260, whether you have submitted your DS-260, but you've not been scheduled yet. It's the starting status, right? In reality, MVC have got nothing to do with your case. So you ignore everything it says on that page about MVC and everything below, right? Just ignore it. doesn't mean anything. It just means you haven't been scheduled yet. That's all it means, okay? Uh, winners from uh, Azerbaijan. I oh, just talked about that. What do you think about the way that they're posting the DS two sixty? I think it's fine. Um, again, it's three weeks. We're three weeks into it. Give them a bloody chance, right? And three those three weeks, by the way, that we've had Christmas and New Year in the middle of that, right? It's December 9th They made this change. Just leave them alone to try and see if they can get things working right, and we'll see. Um, F sixteen K DQ. What's your chances of don't answer that? Please talk about Liberia. Liberia. Like, I'm going to talk about Liberia. I don't know much about Liberia. I've heard it's a great country. I don't know anything else about it. What, what do you want me to talk about? Try and be specific in your questions if you want the specific answer. When will 2NL start again? In the next few days, Mataza. I think we'll see some 2NLs in, in the next few days in, in, um, uh, in early January, right? They'll start working again tomorrow. Um, you know, maybe by the end of the week, we'll see some 2NLs for February interviews. Uh, so it'll work. Um, can get to an L, I don't know. Uh, talked about that one, 9th of June, blah, blah, blah. What's your chances? Guzcon's not answering that one. No one. When will I become current? Family of five persons still in Turkey. You still like Turkey meals, but no idea. Uh, any ideas how to make the embassies work faster? We are three months back in the cases. Not really. It's actually up to them. I know you don't want to hear this answer, but it's up to them. Um, the, the, some of the lawyers were lamenting and acting surprised. I thought this was a bit weird <laughs> that they were acting surprised, but they always do this. They, they sort of, um, they sort of act surprised about some things that are bloody obvious. So when the when the tier four um, uh, when tier four uh, prioritization was removed. The announcement said that it was going to be up to the embassies to decide, you know, how to prioritize cases. That's always been the case. It wasn't news. Uh, it's always been the case. And then there was a declaration um, that that said some of the embassies might still be applying a tier four type prioritization. And the and the lawyers um, were up in arms about that. Now I understand they have to sort of pick an argument. They have to sort of pick a fight. But that wasn't news. Um, you know, that is the case, right? Um, now, is it a formalized prioritization thing as it was by the Department of State? No, but it is the case that the embassy gets to decide how many, uh, you know, what their capacity is in general and how many of that capacity that they're going to allocate for each visa type. They've always had that ability, right? We've just never worried about it because it's always been sufficient. It's not sufficient right now because they've got low staffing levels, they've got different procedures, and the capacity of the embassies in general is lower than it was in some cases. So now we're more worried about it. But but um, why we pretend it's news when it's not news, I, I, I don't know. Um, so there you go. Um, another one, do I have to, and a chance to be interviewed? I'm not going to answer the question, Joseph. Um, Oh, I've answered that question a million times. Um, mm, 
Another question here, Joseph. Oh, same Joseph. Uh, do you have a chance? I'm still not going to answer that question. Uh, due to some situations, I could go on a, I could not get travel document or passport in the country I'm residing. Can the American Embassy help me in this case? What do you recommend me? They're not going to help you get a travel document, but um, the, uh, you know, if you're saying that you're going to go to the interview and you don't have a passport or a travel document or anything else, there are some things that they can do at that point. You'll have to discuss it with the embassy at that point. So go ahead and do that, right? Um, the travel document at that point will be a sort of a one-time use to get into the um, into the USA, right? So it's possible. It, you know, in that case, by the way, sorry, let me go back, Susanna. In that case, it can't be based on your laziness. It's it's based on your inability, and I mean inability to get the documents, right? Not because you can't be bothered, right? It's got to be a genuine thing because you've had to go to some other country because of per persecution in your own home country and that sort of thing. Uh, Happy New Year to you. Well, not the 2020. Um, oh, okay, so let me clear this up. You say, I'm not the plaintiff for DV2020. Yes, you are. Because uh, the Gomez case was certified as a class action on September 30th, uh, 2020. Um, it was certified as a class action, which meant it covered everybody. And uh, Jesse Bless and some other um, lawyers are responsible still for those cases under the Gomez um, banner, as it were, and it includes some of the other lawsuits too. So you are a plaintiff. You're just not a named plaintiff, but you're a plaintiff. You're covered by that case. So you've got an opportunity to get one of the 9,095 visas, um, depending on your particular circumstance, right? How far advanced you were, whether you were allocated to the embassy or um, you know whether you had a, an interviewer yet or, or those sort of things. You just have to wait for a little while, okay? Um, okay. I'm just scanning down to see if there's any more good questions here. Um, uh, you're in Ghana. What I'm saying about the fraud is true, unfortunately, but my sister's family won and their case number is 19XX, but yet to receive the 2NL. So worried. I, I, when I was saying that early, earlier about the fraud, I did want to add, and I didn't add, and I should have said, um, the few cases I've seen interviewed very recently in Accra have been processed, it seems, with a different attitude. So maybe there's more chance of approval these days. We'll have to wait and see. But I'm hoping that that one in eight cases being approved and the rest being denied, I'm hoping that's gone away. We'll, we'll have to see. It depends. It partly depends how pissed off the consular officers are. Imagine seeing case after case with bullshit documents every day of the week, right? You probably get pissed off. Now, since they haven't been seeing many cases, maybe they're in a happier mood. I don't know. Maybe they're happy to see people, and so that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. Or there could have been some sort of policy change that, that clarifies you know, things, or just general improvements in document standards. I, I don't know. I'm not sure of the reasons, but it's a possibility. Okay? So good luck for your sister anyway. So your sister, yeah, your sister's family. Good luck for her. Um, okay, I'm just trying to scan down here for some questions. Oh, okay, let me answer this one. It's a good question. You tried to sort of uh, try to answer your own question, so thank you for doing that. So your AS twenty thousand six hundred and something. After checking the CAC data on the DV charts, uh, you see that there's 10,100 cases in front of me and 2,400 after me. Does that mean you're a high number? Sort of, yes. Now, of the 20, of the 10,000 cases in front of you, um, roughly, uh, let me just think, Nepal would have about 2,000 cases and Iran would have about 3,000. So roughly half of those are Nepal and, and Iran, right? That means that there's 5,000 cases in front of you, which are rest of Asia. Now, the rest of Asia are going to be left with the remains after Nepal and uh, Iran take their pickings because Nepal and Iran are uh, all under case number 14,000, right? All of them, right? Um, 
So it really depends what happens in Nepal and Iran. So if you see that Kathmandu Embassy, for example, opens up, and you're not a, you're not in either one of those countries. Obviously, you're not uh, you're not allocated to Nepal or Iran. Um, but if you see that those embassies open up, then it's bad news for you, right? If Nepal uh, if Nepal doesn't interview people, it gives uh, it gives your chance. Uh, it gives your case a bit more chance. If you see Iranians suddenly getting you know lots of interviews and being processed then it gives you more chance right uh sorry if, if more of them are being processed it will reduce your chance right so um so is it a high number yeah it's sort of a high number does it mean it's impossible i don't know yet i'll have to wait and see okay um hope that makes sense but at least you try to figure out you know something so i appreciate you trying um Delecto, Delectio, is there any chance? I, I don't know. It's another sort of question I can't really ask, uh, answer. Uh, same sort of thing. Mm. When would my case be current? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with the VB, by the way, because <clears throat> one of the things with the BB, VB I don't think people understand is when you see that some embassy or the VB is at case number 20,000, for example, it does not mean that all the cases under 20,000 have already been serviced, right? So if with the process they go to to decide what to set the VB at for the next VB uh, or the one after that or whatever, is they figure out, first and foremost, how many people who are already current because their case number is under the 20,000 how many people are now documentarily qualified and waiting for interviews under that 20,000 20, number? Um, and will that fill the capacity? If their capacity is, let's say, I mean, I'm, just, I'm just picking numbers here. I'm not saying this is true. But if Africa Embassy capacity was 1,500 cases and, uh, and they could get 1,450 cases from, the, from under 20,000, then the VB would probably not move at all, or would move very little. Maybe a thousand or two case, a uh, thousand or two case numbers, right? On the other hand, if under twenty thousand they don't have a lot of cases ready for interviewing, um, then they will move the VB faster. But the point is that since December 9th, and and the ability to get scheduled because you know through documentarily qualified has changed, I'm expecting. If things went well, I hate making predictions, but anyway, if things work the way they should work, we should not see very big case number movement in the VB. That's unfortunately me sort of letting a cat out of a bag in terms of a prediction, because we've got a lot more cases that are already current that now should be uh, becoming uh, DQ, that should be DQ'd pretty easily. And so they shouldn't actually be moving the VB very quickly for a month or two. Now, that could be totally wrong because that data may not have flowed through to the visa office yet. And it may be that they still move the next VB a few cases, even though it just sort of exacerbates the problem. But we'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens, right? So I'm, I can't predict what will happen in your particular case anyway. That's what I'm trying to get to. It's not that I don't think about predictions, by the way, people. It's not that I don't think about it. I just try and be very cautious what I predict because I don't want to give the wrong impression. I don't want to give false hopes. I don't want to give negative hopes. I don't want to cause someone to give up hope when actually they get a chance later. I don't want the, the other thing to happen where I say, you know, you're going to be fine, and actually something goes badly wrong, totally unrelated to DV, let's say, and all of a sudden they're not fine. I don't want that responsibility. And I want people to understand that there are lots of things going on here some of which are, uh, and you know, we're able to anticipate and calculate, and some of them we're not. And so I, I feel like I don't, I don't want to be the fool that makes the predictions that turns out to be wrong, that actually makes someone behave in a certain way that causes them a problem. I don't want to do that. Um, and, and it's just, you know, it's just dopey trying to make predictions. You just need to wait and see. Um, so, yeah, I often say. Only a fool would try and predict. And then in the next moment, I see someone trying to predict. <laughs> okay. 
it made it clear who you are. Um, I have his picture on my phone right. You're not telling me, please, Hussein, that in some country around the world there's someone with a a screensaver on their phone of me. You poor, poor man. If that's really what. You <laughs> oh dear, that would be hilarious. I don't. I hope you don't mean that. I hope I misunderstand that. But anyway, who's saying that's funny? Um, question. The question is this: How much is the percentage of authenticity of the data published on the statistics website? If you mean the official DV, you know, the official um, there's um, there's a page which is from Department of State, which is. The monthly issuance data. When you when you Google the term DV lottery statistics, that's what will come up. Or monthly insurances. Uh, that's a hundred percent official. A hundred percent, right? If you want to, if you're actually referring to the SEAC data that we've scraped, it's official data. It's the real data. We've scraped it from the database. The database not, may not may not be completely accurate, but it's data we've obtained from the official database. So um, it's accurate data. If you're talking about some idiot that's created his own set of data or his own, you know, his own estimates based on some bullshit information, then you know I can't I can't really talk to that. Um, but there you go. Uh, right, one or two more questions, then we we'll call it a day. Um, I'm, I'm going to look for some decent questions here. I'll try. Okay. I'm tired, so tired asking this question. So what about our 9,095? Have I answered that for you, uh, E-Black Classic? What strange haircut you've got there. Um, I hope that really didn't happen on the top of your head. Uh, but anyway, I'm sorry you're tired of asking. I'm sorry you're tired of waiting. Everybody's tired. Um, but this is what it's like to rely on a legal system in a country that has decent laws as opposed to some, you know, third world country nation that has a crappy uh, political and legal system that just lets people act like gods and kings and queens, etc., and change laws. And I come from a country where we do have kings and queens, but, but we've taken away their powers, right? What was, we have a democratic system, we have a legal system, etc. Um, so, uh, but, you know, the reality is justice is a slow process. And, you know, it doesn't always get you what you want either, right? So, you know, we just have to wait. So I'm sorry you're tired. Uh, you don't have to wait anymore. That is your choice. You have control over your life. You can move on, right? In any normal year, you would have lost your opportunity already. If you want to wait, you can wait. If you don't want to wait, you don't have to. Uh, this guy, Delectio, stop spamming. Pissing me off. Um... Is public charge a step of DV 2022? Thanks for asking this question. Yes, it is. Um, the, Trump tried to change an aspect of the immigration process relating to public charge, and that was struck down by um, a, a, a government, um, by a court case, and it was removed, right? But that did not remove the rest of the public charge requirement. There is a standard... Um, there's a standard piece of immigration law. It's INA, um, what is it, 2044A, you know, I, I, something like that. Um, it's a standard piece of immigration law that refers to uh, the consular officer should assume that someone is ineligible to immigrate until they have proven that that person has some sort of financial plan you know, support, etc., in order to move to the USA. That's a part of immigration law all over the place, right? It's the same for an employment visa case or an uh, employment immigration case or a family immigration case or a DV case. It's still there. Now, the way that that law is satisfied in DV cases varies a little bit from country to country and from case to case. Um, the I-134 is, a, is an adjustment, is a... Uh, an affidavit of support process that you can use to show that you've got someone in America who is willing to support you. It's not a legal commitment on them, 
but um, but it, it's helpful. And it's one factor that will be used. And for a lot of DV cases, it's the only thing you need to show. But you can also show that you've got finances, your own savings, that you've got good job prospects in the USA because you've got uh, highly sought after skill sets or high education or something like that. So there are ways to satisfy it. And in some countries, it's uh, a bigger deal than in other countries. In some countries, people tell me time after time, it's not a problem in our country because in our country, we're just, you know, we're brilliant. We're wonderful. And the, and the CEOs never ask for the I-134. Okay, that's always bullshit when people say that to me. It's like, you don't know every case uh, that's happened over the last 20, 30 years or whatever. Um, there are always exceptions to the rules. Uh, as, and, and you've got limited information, as do I. But I, I've, I would say there is no embassy that has never, uh, you know, uh, you know, asked for um, financial documents of some sort. It's, it should be asked. The way it's answered is different in in each case. Okay, and it varies from from embassy to embassy or country to country. And um, Curtis um, was making a big fuss about this recently, saying it's the biggest barrier for uh, for African selectees, which is utter nonsense. It's not at all. Um, it, it comes up for for African cases. Yeah, sure, it comes up for Asian and European cases. It comes up everywhere, right? Um, it's not the biggest barrier. It's one barrier that people need to think about. Um, and frankly, uh, in some embassies, people are given a lot of um, uh, help with satisfying that requirement. So, you know, we shouldn't be complaining about it, frankly. Um, so there you go. Hi, Curtis, if you're watching. <laughs> there was another guy, David, uh, David Blaze or something, Beers. Uh, on Twitter, who was asking a lot of good questions about that. I think he was genuinely interested in knowing uh, information. Um, but again, I think he was originally coming from the point of view of, oh my God, they're asking for an I-134. That's terrible. It's not terrible at all. Uh, you know, you've got to have a plan. You want to come to America? America is an expensive place to live. You can't come here with no money in your pocket uh, and no one to help you, no employment skills, um and you know and expect to to have a good a good experience and you know they shouldn't be giving visas to people who don't have something of that of that nature some money in their pocket right some savings someone here to help you and i'm i-134 some good job prospects you need to have one of those things if not all three of those things because moving to america is hard you shouldn't be coming just to be uh you know on the street homeless well, we've got enough homeless people, thank you very much. Uh, the, the, there's plenty of opportunity here. There's lots of jobs here. But that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It's going to be hard for you as new Im immigrants. So you need, need to understand that. Um, okay, last couple of questions then. I've already said that, but there you go. Last couple of questions. This is a good question. I'm from Nepal, currently in EU. Should I follow the VB according to Nepal or AS? Nepal. You're charged in Nepal. Your case will be um, will be run according to that. I got confused. It's one of the Nepalese living in Tokyo got his two and for February before being current in VB. Yeah, like I said, there is a few cases like that where they've done that. It's a mistake. That's all. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Joseph, I recommend people get nine one thirty four if you've got plenty of money um in your bank account etc um you know then you can get by without an i-134 but i would recommend you have an i-134 it's expensive to to come here right and just having an i-134 is a good thing i spent i think forty thousand dollars in the first month i was in america um uh just on setting up a house and living expenses and being in a hotel for a few weeks and um you know it's expensive to come here um, so, you know, having an I-134, having someone who's willing to help, you know, that's a good thing. So I would definitely take that to an interview if I were you. It just avoids, um, it, it answers the question about public charge just very easily and just move, they move on to the next thing. Um, so, you know, why not? Um, okay. Um, 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 wow. 
tons of questions, although many of them are from one particular donut. Stop doing that, uh, donut. Um, what do I think of the London Embassy? Are they efficient? Yeah, they are. Sometimes they do, you know, I don't know. It's difficult to generalize some of these things, but yeah, they're pretty efficient. I've been there myself uh, for an H1. I got my, I got my DV lottery uh, case processed through adjustment of status in the USA, but, um, but my H1 uh, was processed through London. They seemed very efficient with that. And, and for DV cases, they generally seem to be good. Okay, uh, last question then. I'm from Pakistan. Can I apply for the DV lottery visa, please? No, I often get this from, from Bangladeshis as well. There are some countries that are excluded from the list of people who can apply for the DV lottery because those countries already send enough people to the USA, and this is the diversity visa lottery, meaning they want a diversity of other people. So if they've already got enough people coming to the USA from the UK, they stopped people from the UK coming to to America through the lottery. That's what happened in my in my case, right? I was not eligible to apply for the DV lottery myself through my own country of birth. I was eligible to apply through my wife's country of birth, and she was eligible because she was born in Spain. Um, Pakistan is excluded for the same reason that UK is. So is China. So is Bangladesh. So is you know, about ten more countries. Okay, so no, in Pakistan, there are enough people coming through family-based and employment-based um, immigration from your country that your country is not going to be allowed to get back on the DV lottery. Neither is my country. Okay, so sorry about that. Uh, if you marry someone to it from another country that is eligible, then, uh, then you can go that route. <coughs> okay, everybody. Um, that's it. I've had fun, but I've, you know, it's been an hour and a half. Thank you for some of you that hang in the whole time. Can't believe you do it. Um, but I appreciate that. Please in 2022, if you're not already subscribed to my channel, go and subscribe. That's the first thing. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs down. Give me whatever you want. Some sort of reaction to this video. Feedback is nice and it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Let's try and, you know, elevate my channel, please. So I can get the information out. Uh, I do this for no money. Um, uh, I, I get a little bit of income. I, I want to answer this, actually. I've been asked about this. I get a little bit of income from the YouTube videos. Not very much. It's peanuts, really. But it pays for the hosting of my blog, which I've been paying for myself, and that's nice. Um, and, you know, it just, just helps out a little bit. I don't really think about it very much. But it's a little bit of money. It's not very much. I wouldn't recommend YouTubing as a... Uh, as a um, as an income stream to anybody, as yeah, I put a lot more time into this than the money ever comes back. Believe me, um, but uh, but it's you know it's it's nice. But more importantly for me is by getting my channel uh, to be widely circulated, I then hear less bullshit coming back. Right, I really try and give accurate information, and I hear a lot of bullshit. And there are some YouTubers and there are some other people that just put bullshit out there. So if we can elevate my YouTube channel, there'll be better information out there. That means we all have less confusion uh, in this year and next year and every other year as the DV lottery continues. Because you know my voice uh, will be giving you know more accurate information. I'm not going to change the accurate information I, I give, right? So if you can do that, that'd be great. Thank you for that. And as I say, do subscribe. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining me this morning. All right. Good luck. Bye-bye.